So um, contrary to the date, the incorrect date on the front of your bulletin, today is not September 15th. It is September 22nd. And I want to know, does anyone know what the significance of September 22nd is? Ken? It's Hobbit Day. Yes, it is Hobbit Day. So for those of you who do not know what Hobbit Day is, um, it's or <laughs> Michael just said, oh no. <laughs> Hobbit Day's origins are drawn from J.R.R. Tolkien's epic fantasy, The Lord of the Rings. And um, in the first book of the trilogy, which is The Fellowship of the Ring, it names September 22nd as Bilbo and Frodo's birthday. So those are the two hobbits that are at the center of the story. So at some point in like Tolkien nerddom, fans designated today as the day to nerd out on all things Lord of the Rings. So typically the way Hobbit Day goes is you watch all three movies. So it's, it's like starts at nine in the morning, it ends at like 11. So you watch all three movies, you dress up like Lord of the Rings characters, and you eat the food of Middle Earth, like Sam's potato soup. And I came like this close to actually showing the trailer to Return of the King at the top of my sermon, but then I thought, if I do that, I'm gonna just lose everyone, <laughs> and we'll all be like, let's watch the movies, including me. Um, so, you know, there's a reason why there are so many of us who are captured, whose imaginations have been captured by Tolkien's trilogy. So he understood something about the power of fantasy and the imagination. So Tolkien would use the term fairy tales, maybe not as we might typically think of it, but he used the term fairy tales to talk about what it was that he created. So to Tolkien, fairy tales were made of the stuff of creation these themes that echoed from the very beginning of time through legend and myth and simmered through the ages, passed down from generation to generation. And in them, he wrote, we see glimpses of reality, like with a capital R. In, in that, these stories express these like, very ancient and universal themes of like triumph and loss and victory and suffering and struggle and freedom and courage and sacrifice and fellowship. So he wrote this wonderful essay on fairy tales called Tree and Leaf. And if you've never read it, I highly recommend that you read it. And he talks about the different functions of these fairy tales. And one of those functions he calls recovery. So this is what he writes. Recovery, which includes return and renewal of health, is a regaining. Regaining of a clear view. Seeing things as we were meant to see them. We need to clean our windows so that the things seen clearly may be freed from the drab blur of triteness or familiarity. In other words, he's saying there's something about reading these stories that clears our vision and reminds us of what is really true and real and enduring. In other words, seeing with the eyes of faith, as scripture calls it. So we're in this liturgical season, this new season of creation, which is all about, as I was saying earlier, renewing and repairing and restoring our relationship to God, one another, and all of creation. And so two weeks ago, I talked about, you know, what it means for us to hope and to act with creation. And then last week, Leisha talked about love, you know, how in these turbulent times we might participate in making the world new. So we want to round out that little triad and today talk about faith, you know, what it means for us to see what is really real with a capital R. So our scripture reading for today from Revelation, it functions much like Tolkien's fairy tales, like seeing things as we were meant to see them. So the book of Revelation, it's often been seen as this like code map for the end times, like who's the Antichrist and people kind of speculating about all of that. But really at its heart, Revelation is a pastoral letter. So John, the Apostle John, was simply a pastor of a church caught between two worlds. You know, what's sometimes referred to as the already, not yet. Like the kingdom of God is already here. It's already at hand, but it's not here yet in its fullness. 
And so Christians at that time, they were feeling this tension of living between these two worlds. Like some were experiencing persecution at the hands of the Roman Empire. Some of them were being killed for not bowing down to Caesar. You know, others, we learn, were suffering from this like spiritual lukewarmness. You know, they weren't hot or cold. They weren't for Jesus or against him. They were just addicted to their own comfort and security. And so in this scene, you know, John is taken up to the door of a heaven. And he's like immediately met with this scene of such like richness and color and sight and sound. And it's like frightening and beautiful and strange, like all at the same time. And at the center of this awesome visual visual picture is the throne of God. And this image of the throne, it denotes authority and power, majesty, splendor, sovereignty. And it's functioning in this story as not just like this ornate piece of furniture that John thinks is really cool, but rather the throne symbolizes the one who is seated on that throne. The prophet Isaiah writes about this one. He says, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? The Lord sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground that he blows on them and they wither. A whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. The image here is of rulers of the world, you know, from think of kings, presidents, prime ministers, parading before God in all of their pomp and circumstance and power. And it's this almost like comical picture, like the the comparison between the two, these grasshoppers and this, this magisterial God on the throne above the circle of the earth. And it's like they're parading before him and it says that God kind of goes like this, And they are all just swept away, you know, just swept away in this whirlwind of God's power and sovereignty. You know, I just had this funny picture in mind of like Kim Jong-un from North Korea, and he's like hanging onto a lamppost, you know, just holding on for dear life. And this whirlwind is just, you know, just blows him away. You know, we are only 44 days from really one of the most consequential elections of our lifetime. And there's a lot of anxiety, and it will only grow increasingly more so as we get closer to November 6, of who is going to end up in the White House. You know, it is the most powerful political position in the world. And whoever becomes the next president will have a very real impact on the lives of millions of people around the world. And we cannot put our heads in the sand about that. Like, that's just real, right? But as Christians living in 2024, much like Christians living in the first century in the Roman Empire, what grounds us ultimately is not who sits in the White House, but who sits on the throne of the universe. And this isn't some simple-minded illusion that we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel better about the state of the world. But what John is saying to us is that this is a full-blooded, full-hearted reality with a capital R. And what faith is, is faith is seeing. Having, like that song we sang, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Help me to see what is really real, even in the midst of what I see with my physical eyes. And that's what faith is, seeing the true heart of reality, And from that place, we act not with anxiety, but from love, praying, organizing, voting, creating, caring, singing, aligning ourselves to that vision that we see. In other words, worshiping. You know, worship 
is our faith-filled response to God, it includes everything that we are doing today and beyond in the other six days of our weeks. And in this vision, we see these divine worshipers. They're these like funky, winged, eye-covered creatures that have like a face like an ox, a lion, an eagle, and a man. And there are these heavenly worship leaders. You know, so the, the eyes, I once saw, um, it's funny, you should Google this, but somebody sent me a picture of an AI-generated picture of an angel, like angels in the, um, in, the, in the scriptures. And normally when we see angels, like pictures of angels, they look like Chris Hemsworth. You know, like they're like blonde and like muscular. But um, this is, you gotta Google this. It's just this weird looking creature with like a hundred eyes over it and like wings sticking out of it. But what those eyes represent are seeing. It's vision, like these creatures see reality for what it is. They are seeing, they've got vision, they, they are alert to everything, like nothing escapes their notice. And because they see reality as it is, they respond to God with all the fullness and the freedom and the joy and the power of worshiping the Lord and creator of the universe. So there's this old like worship song from the 90s that I used to love. And uh, <laughs> Michael goes, mm, yeah, <laughs> 90s worship songs. Um, but the way it goes is, <laughs> the way it goes is, if we could see how much your worth, your power, your might, your endless love, then surely we would never cease to praise you. And so that's why these living creatures, they see how much God is worth, and they never cease to praise God, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You are worthy to receive all honor and glory and power and wisdom. They're saying you are Lord over the past. You are Lord over our present. And you are Lord over our future, even 44 days from now, no matter who gets elected, that we don't forget who sits on that throne. And then what happens? You know, John sees these 24 elders with crowns on their head. And in response, what they are doing is they are casting down their crowns in worship before the throne of God. You know, and commentators think that they represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. This representation of the, the entirety of the people of God across salvation history, which includes us. So let me ask. Have you ever noticed these paintings behind me? Right, you look at them every single Sunday, you see them. And in case you're wondering who they are, it represents the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so all the way over here, let me see, is this right? Yeah. So we, over here, we've got um, Abraham who stepped out in faith into an unknown land and future with his family. We've got the prophet Isaiah holding his scroll. Isaiah who lived in a time of great oppression, who lived in an empire that was very violent. And he was holding his scroll where he wrote about the coming Messiah and what that Messiah's kingdom would be like, one of peace and of justice and of restoration. You've got Moses with the Ten Commandments representing the kind of, of right living where we love God and we love our neighbor as ourselves. You know, we've got David, you know, with his harp, this shepherd who turned into a king um, who defeated the giant Goliath. And then at the very front, we have Hannah, you know, the mother of the prophet Samuel, who struggled with infertility. And yet through her faith, you know, one of the greatest prophets of Israel was born. Then on this side, we've got Mary, the mother of Jesus, who probably more than any other character in the Bible spoke one of the most beautiful expressions of faith. Just here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me as you have promised. We have Matthew, who was a, this despised collect, tax collector, this pawn of the government, who turned into a disciple, who wrote the first gospel of the New Testament. We've got John who's holding the cup that represents that wine that he drank with Jesus at the Last Supper. 
There's Stephen, the first martyr, you know, with the palms, you know, the one who saw that vision of Jesus seated, enthroned in heaven, even as he was being killed. And we have Paul with the sword, the one who persecuted Christians and yet became one of the greatest evangelists and church planters um, of this new expression of the Jesus, the, the church of Jesus Christ. And if they were physically here today, I think all of them would be completely surprised that there's paintings of them behind me. Because just like you and me, they were ordinary people, you know, just trying to be faithful. And they lived, and they suffered, and they struggled, and they failed, and they prayed, and they persevered, and they put their hope in God in the most critical, vulnerable, chaotic moments of their lives and of their world. These 24 elders representing the people of God, you know, worshiping God, throwing down their crowns, which represent like, the best of what they have, their glory, their honor, their authority, all that they have to give. And they're saying to the one seated on the throne, Lord, it is all about you. It is all for you. This is all because of you. Centered and grounded and rooted in their worship of God. You know, when we can, like them, learn to cast our crowns down, you know, that need that we have to control, those things that are in our power, our need to predict outcomes, you know, whatever those tr trust structures are that we put our faith in, that make us feel, you know, safe and secure, you know, whatever those things may be, that when we worship God and we fix those eyes of faith on God once again, that's why we do this week in and week out, because we need that vision of God. It frees us to worship God by loving this world that God so loves and fighting for it and giving ourselves for it and giving ourselves for its healing and its wholeness. You know, whatever little corner of the, wor of the world we may be in right now. So I'm gonna invite us to just bow our heads for a moment. And I'm gonna ask you and just invite the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our hearts in faith this morning and just to see with those eyes of our heart the one who is seated on the throne of the universe. And maybe this morning, um, you're actually not sure if you trust that that's real. You know, if you really trust that God is on the throne, because it seems, it sure seems like there's a lot of other things that are on the throne right now, whether it's in our political system or in our lives. And so I invite you now just to acknowledge that, you know, to feel that, um, to speak that to God. You know, where are you struggling to really trust in the Lordship of Jesus right now? Maybe tied to that, you know, what, what are you feeling anxious about this morning? You know, that can often give us a clue as to where our eyes are fixed. You know, what are you feeling anxious about? You know, whether it's the state of our world or the state of your life, um, the state of the community you live in, your kids, your loved ones. You know, in worship, we just lay that down before the Lord. And we remind ourselves um, that God sees and God knows and God holds us 
and our loved ones and our world in God's hands. And maybe we just in our in our minds, in our own thoughts, in our hearts, that we just say, like blind Bartimaeus, Lord, I want to see. I want to see you. I need to see you today. And just give me that vision of you. I need your help and your grace in seeing. sense or hear um, Erin um, playing a song that I love a little earlier that we don't have the words to um, called We Fall Down. And if you know it, you can sing it with me. If you don't, you can just listen and let just let the words um, wash over you. I'm going to invite us to stand. together. We're going to listen to this together. We fall down. And we fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet Jesus, we fall down, and we fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. Jesus. 